All right, so let's uh, turn to Exodus 20. We're just going to pick up from where we left off and keep moving. I'll probably just uh, recap a little bit. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Thursday night Bible study. This is our second uh, part in dealing with the discriminating mercies of a jealous God. And we're dealing with the conditional love of God um, for those who are covenant faithful, those who are faithful to the covenant. Um, if you have any questions, feel free, those of you that are here, to raise your hand. What's up, Levi? What's going on with you? Um, and all the kids. Uh, did everybody have an outline? Everybody? What's up? Hey, how you doing here? Um, all right, so if you have any questions, raise your hand. If you have any questions on um, uh, on, on the Zoom, uh, just uh, post them. Uh, if you're Facebook Live, you have questions, just go ahead and type them in, and we'll try our best to get uh, back to you. Um, turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 5 and 6, and then we're just going to uh, continue to move on. Hopefully, everybody has an outline. If you do not, go to grace-bible.com. And uh, you should be able to find it there. Um, usually, I uh, post them, but um, delayed in some time today. Are you letting people know? Okay. Um, so, uh, Exodus chapter 20, let's look at verse 5. Verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. You shall not bow down yourself to them, that is to idols, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And thus is a reading of God's word. The thing that I want to open up with that pretty much summarizes um, the introduction that I made last, uh, last week and brought us through the first point up to the second point. If I were to summarize it, it is this, that God promises if you discriminate in your worship of him alone and no one else, he promises to discriminate in showing you mercy and no one else except those that actually show him love and worship. In fact, if you look in this text, God is discriminating. He says, don't bow down to any other idols, right? Don't bow down to any other idols. You should only worship God. So you should only favor God and worship him because he is God and alone should we serve God. But no idols, no serving, no crafting, no worshiping them. Then God says, the reason why I'm saying this is because I am a discriminating God. I am a holy God. Here's what he says. I am a jealous God. And he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. And the children's children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. And showing mercy to thousands upon them who love him. So isn't God discriminating directly in our text? He's saying, I'm showing mercy to those who love me and keep my commandments. I'm showing my favor towards them. But I am showing my hatred towards those who hate me. What does this mean? God is saying, I love those who love me, right? I love those who love me, hate those who hate me. God is angry with the wicked every day. He hates all workers of iniquity. So embedded in this statement here is a promise. You love God and you keep his commandments and you don't love anyone else the way that you love God. Like you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. By faith in Jesus Christ, who did it for us. If you're worshiping the true and living God and no one else, you're not bowing down to idols, you're not bowing down to those who um, are in the government who are crossing the line, you're not 
bowing down to other mandates that God doesn't tell you to bow down to. You're not just saying yes to God, but you're saying no to those who try to usurp the authority of God. If you are demonstrating a discrimination in that sense, the promise is that God is going to show you mercy, right? He's going to show you mercy. He's going to show his people mercy, which means if you are his, if you belong to him, if you are born again, if you are a recipient of the covenant of grace and Christ has purchased you and redeemed you by his blood and has made you his and made you his bride. Every single one of God's children, every single one of God's people elect have and will continue to receive mercy. Okay. And so we, 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 we talked about this briefly. Um, the first point that we dealt with last week is God loves to show pity to the destitute. This is a part of his goodness. And remember, we went to Exodus 34, um, and he revealed himself to Moses um, as he was showing Moses his glory. And in Exodus 34, verse 6, if you would turn there, we're going to see that again. We want to continue to let these thoughts um, stay in our hearts and in our minds. In verse 6, I'll start at verse 5. It says, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. What's the first attribute? Merciful. Merciful. The very first thing that he mentions, he is full of mercy. We emphasized this last week. Merciful. Long, uh, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the, into the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth. And he did what? He worshiped him. He worshiped him. He reveals himself as a God of mercy. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. I, I, I only touched Exodus 34, but I want to look at verse 31 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. In verse 31, start at verse 29, he says this. But if from thence you shall seek the Lord your God and shall find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things are come upon you, even in the latter days, if you turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient unto his voice. Verse 31 says, for the Lord your God is what? Y'all following me? Is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore unto them. He is a merciful God. He is right in showing mercy. We talked about this last week, that when God shows mercy, he's not showing justice. Mercy is not justice. He's not showing, but it's not without justice. It's not as though God is violating his justice. It's not injustice for God to show mercy. And we're going to talk about that later. When I talk about mercy, what 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 um is in your outline? What Lewis Burkhoff says is this. He says the goodness of the goodness or love of God shown to those who are in misery or distress, irrespective of their deserts. In his mercy, God reveals himself as a, as a compassionate God who pities those who are in misery and is ever ready to relieve their distress. God loves to show pity. And one of the things that, 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 that we should know in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, over against verse 5, 
is that God is, is see, he, he is executing vengeance. He's executing justice. He's executing judgment upon those who hate him to the third and fourth generation while, oh, while showing mercy to thousands of generations. And that, 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 that should leap out of the page about the character of God. And that is this, that God is ready to show mercy and he is abundant in the mercy that he shows. And he would rather show mercy than to destroy you. You see, he, he would rather show mercy than he does not take delight in the perishing of the wicked, but that they should repent and that they should live. This is what we should get here. Um, and, and what God's mercy teaches us is that God is something very simple. God is good. He is good. It is his goodness. It is his compassion. It is his pity towards the sinful towards the miserable, towards the destitute. Not only does he love to show pity to the destitute because it is his goodness, but he lavishly pours out his mercy to thousands, all right? This has to do with his greatness, the greatness of God, not just the goodness of God. Now we're talking about the greatness of God when you consider thousands, when you consider thousands. Look at sub point A in your outline. His mercy is throughout the ages. Now, one of the number one principles that I think about when he, when God promises to show mercy to thousands upon those who love him and those who keep his commandments is that God is promising to be with his people. It's a very simple, it's the Emmanuel principle. He is promising to be with his people, never to leave them, nor forsake those that love him and keep his commandments. Those who don't leave God, those who are loyal to God, those who love God, God is loyal to, God loves, and he never leaves nor forsakes, okay? This is, this is the, the, the point, this is that principle, but I want you to see something here, and we're going we're gonna to dive into this. In Exodus 20, we're made to think about something very critical. We're, we're made to think about the soul reap principle, where it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow, that shall he also what? Reap. Right. Well, this is precisely what he's teaching here in Exodus chapter 20 verse 5 and 6. This is what he's teaching here in the Mosaic Covenant. Um, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and he is show, he's demonstrating that if you as a father, as a leader, as a head, worship idols and teach your children to worship, worship idols and, work, and therefore teach your children to hate me, they are going to follow suit. And what God is going to have to do is he's going to have to bring upon the consequences of those generations that hate him as a consequence of the leadership breaking down, forsaking God and worshiping idols, bowing down in areas that they shouldn't bow down in, worshiping and serving mindlessly those that are not God, giving their allegiance. And again, Jesus even taught about discriminating. We're just, no one's neutral, okay? No one is neutral at all. You have to know this. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. It's impossible, okay? The reason why is because we're made in his image and likeness. You cannot serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. You're going to be loyal to one. You're going to loathe the other. You're going to serve one. You're going to sin against the other. You can't be, there's no neutrality when it comes to being a human being. Discrimination in a positive and negative sense exists because of who we are, okay? We're made in the image and likeness of God. So, so again, the, 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 the thing that is reaped, the, the thing that is promised to those who forsake God, don't obey his commandments and worship idols, that he's going to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation on those who hate him. 
So we're, we're, we're clear about that. There's qualifiers very clear. We can't read into the text anything, right? Which means the implication is that not everyone will follow their father and their mother in evil. God will show mercy and save some, won't he? And like, like, like some of y'all, I'm, I'm a byproduct of one of those things. Uh, I'm a byproduct of God saving me, of God having mercy upon me, saving me from going down the path of idol worship. And I grew up worshiping idols. Glory be to God that he would deliver a wretch like me. And I'm not as, I'm not as grateful as I should be. Lord, help me. Right? Lord, help me. But the point here is that God is laying down a soul free principle. Then he says in verse six, I'm showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Well, even though it doesn't say uh, visiting the righteousness of the father, of the fathers upon the children and the children's children for thousands of years, that's precisely what God is saying. And there's a promise there. But the qualifier is he's visiting, he's visiting them with his mercies to those who love him and keep his commandments, right? So the children that actually believe, honor their mother and their father, that, that actually watch them and they learn from them what it means to worship God, what it means to love God, what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what it means to um, live holy, what it means to um, mortify the deeds of the flesh, put to death sin, stop sinning, what, what, what it means um, to, to, to uh, stand before God just in his sight by faith in Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness, and only worshiping Christ and worshiping the Father and the Spirit. The children that learn this and that God uses that teaching by model and, and by ministry, he makes them children of God because he chose them in Christ from before the foundation of the world, and he has mercy upon them. This is something that we can know for sure, that if you are seriously committed to raising up your children the right way, there is a promise that comes with you worshiping God for your children, okay? For your children, for your children. There's a promise there. There's a promise there. It does not promise all your children are going to be saved because there's a qualifier. And we're going to talk about this for a moment. So look at the promise of mercy to the children of those who love God and keep his commandments. Now, we're talking about representation. Remember what it says here in Genesis. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. I want to walk this out a little bit just so you can see that this is a principle that has been laid down from the beginning. Um, in Genesis chapter 3, this is the gospel. God preaches good news to the ears of Adam and Eve who are in a state of depravity and condemnation because Adam, the representative head, has actually sinned and has fallen short of God's glory. And he passed this sin and death to all of his posterity because all have sinned. In fact, if you read Romans chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, um, it says, through one man's sin came into the world, through sin, death, and death passed to all men for all have sinned. You see, the soul re principle a father acting on the behalf of his children and not worshiping God and obeying God, but worshiping himself and, and, and eating from that tree. His sin, the, the, the effect of the sin, which we call in, in theology original sin, um, the, the passing of the corruption, the passing of the condemnation to the children takes place immediately. There's no one. So, so then we have passages like Psalm chapter 51, that we were born in, in sin and shaped in iniquity. But here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I want you to see this real quick. God says this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now look also at verse 21. Look at verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Well, first they had 
Um, they had fig leaves where they tried to cover their shame and tried to cover their guilt by covering their body. Um, you know, they, they no longer had a righteousness. They felt, they realized that they were naked. They didn't have a covering. Um, they were not innocent anymore. Um, and, and they tried to cover and hide their sins and God came to them and he stripped them of their fig leaf self-righteousness of trying to cover themselves and he clothed them with coats of skin. He, he killed an animal, a kid, and he made, he actually made from that skin a coat and he covered Adam and he covered Eve. And that points to what God actually has to do in order to save us and to make us acceptable in his sight where our sinfulness that leaves us uncovered is actually dealt with in the slaying of a sacrifice and we're covered not by our own fig leaf self-righteousness but the righteousness of an innocent spotless lamb pointing to who christ christ is our righteousness now why do i go here in light of dealing with this reap so principle from uh, um, those who are in authority, like fathers to children. Well, because in the next chapter, what you see is two children who are brothers, right? They're brothers having the same parents being taught. They were taught the same thing. They were taught how to worship God. They both were, right? But do they both worship God correctly? No. no, they do not. Does God accept both of their sacrifices or offerings? No, he does not. Does God discriminate in Genesis chapter 4? He does. He, does. he shows favor to one and he shows rejection and hatred towards another. And so who does he show favor to? Well, he shows favor to Abel. Abel's sacrifice was an animal, a, a, a kid, a lamb. The, the, it was the fat of the flock, the best that he had. He gave the best that he had an animal, the life of an animal. That teaches that... We need a sacrifice to give up his life in order for us to be saved and for our life to remain, for us to be sustained, for us to be saved. And his sacrifice, Abel's sacrifice, was not a bloodless sacrifice. It was a sacrifice that had blood in it. There was blood that was shed. There was blood that was shed with this animal. Right. So we we see God looks at the blood of an innocent lamb and he has favor towards that. You want to know why he has favor towards that? Because it's rooted in his eternal son. His son is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. And it's God's favor because it's rooted in God's everlasting covenant in his covenant of redemption where he purposed the salvation of all of his people in Christ. And he covenanted with Jesus Christ, who would, who would obligate himself to being made like us so that he can represent us, living for us, because God expects perfection and he knew that we would fail. And dying for us, suffering the penalty of our sins so that God's wrath would be satisfied and his holiness vindicated and raising from the dead after he died so that he could demonstrate that he not only is the true savior, the only savior, the only name given among men by which men shall be saved at the name of Jesus Christ, but to raise for their justification and, and receive on their behalf all of the benefits of perfect obedience, all of the, the benefits of a perfect righteousness so that he can administer those benefits to all that would simply trust him. So, so amazing, so amazing. 
What amazing grace. What mercy. What mercy God would show. But here we see, even in the beginning, this principle being laid out, how that when God established in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, it wasn't something that began to exist concerning the character of God discriminating. No, he is always discriminating. Right. He discriminated in creation. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And he divided the light from the darkness. And he called the light day and called the darkness night. Then you jump into uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shown in your heart to give you the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of who? Jesus Christ. He Not only this, this is the message that we've heard. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God by nature is discriminant by nature. By nature. He is separate. By nature. He's God. He's other than. And he therefore has to discriminate and we talked about this but we're talking about mercy here so he promises he promises this is a promise to the children um, that love him not just to every child i need you guys to get this he qualifies it and he qualifies it in the mosaic covenant now this should be even more glaring it should be even more glaring not only that he's only talking to those in the mosaic covenant he's not talking to anyone else if we want to stay strictly contextual, now it doesn't mean that God is not the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And it doesn't mean that in the covenant of grace, he does not actually um, show mercy. He does. This is the covenant of mercy. Uh, but we have to keep it, keep it tight. He is discriminating even in the Mosaic covenant, and he's laying out conditions. All right. Um, look at, look at uh, Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter 20. I want, to, I want you to see Proverbs chapter 20. In Proverbs chapter 20, you'll see this promise laid out as well. And I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. Look at verse 6. The word of God says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find and then we read, the just man walk in his integrity. Here's the result. His children are blessed after him. What a, this is amazing. His children are blessed. If, he, if a man, if a father walks in integrity, walks in the spirit of God, walks consistent with his conscience, consistent with his faith and doesn't budge to the left or to the right, sowing good seed to his children, whether he is aware of it or not. The promise is his children after him are blessed. His children after him are blessed. Turn to chapter 22 of Proverbs. One of my favorite, one of my, my favorite promises here. I'm sorry, verse four. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the forward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Verse six, train up a child in the way they should go. And when he is old, he will not be part from it. You believe that? Yes. Now, if the way he should go is a person, Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life, and you're walking consistent with the way in which you actually teach. Here's the promise. When they are old, they shall not depart from it. Okay? They shall not <laughs> depart from it. Now, why is this critical? I think by way of application, where we are in our world is uh, very critical to, to think this through because the government is after our children, aren't they? Let's just be honest. Yeah. Children, pay attention. I don't need you to be whispering and talking. At least pay attention to this part because you need to hear this. 
Um, the government wants to vaccinate all of our children with this uh, Pfizer vaccine. Isn't that right? It is 12 and below? 12th grade and below? No. 12 and below? It's 12 years old and below. They're working on Pfizer. And they're working. Yeah. And, and and they've been mandating, you know, this this vaccine and saying, you know, saying if you if you don't get vaccinated, you're gonna lose your job. You know, they they're against, uh, you know, um, uh, religious exemption, but they they know that it's illegal to be against it. It's illegal to to to, to deny it and all that stuff. You know, and I'm, I'm still going through the process for me. For those of you that want to know, um, and, and those of you that want to know more details, stay stay with me afterwards, and I'll share more with you in more detail about what's going on. But um, the government is is after not only me but after my children, and they're 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 after me and my children, and they're after fathers and their children, after mothers and their children, in a in a in a, a ferocious way. Um, you have to really think this through. If if you you know bow down to them, um, <clears throat> where God has not called us to bow down, um, then you give up your family. You give up your children. You give up your children. You have no, you have no grounds to stand on when it comes to defending your own children. Yeah. You have no grounds to stand on whatsoever to defending your own children. You can argue all you want to. And, and, and here's the thing, here's here's what uh what people do. They make a um it's called uh compartmentalizing. Yeah, they 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 say you know I can get the vaccine, but I'm you know because I have because I'm, I'm I'm making a sacrifice. I'm scared or whatever the case is, but I'm not going to let my children get it. Heck no, and I've heard all of this, but what you're not realizing is what our text is saying. The influence of how you live is more than what you say. The influence of what you do is more than what you say. Children look at how they, they could. They're smart. Okay, you said this, but you're doing this, right? Right. This is the point. This is the way of application. We have to, we have to know that when it comes to standing, and I, one of the reasons why I stand is because uh, the government's not my God, and they don't get to tell me to do something that God hasn't told me to do. My allegiance is to Christ. Um, this body is not my own. This body belongs to the Lord. Um, and it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I don't get to do with it whatever I want. I don't get to make a decision based upon fear or based upon me keeping my job or me based upon keeping my benefits or my retirement or me based upon keeping friendship or me being liked or being comfortable or actually just wanting to be a part of the big crowd. I don't get to do any of that because I am not my own. Right, we're still we're still in the text by way of application. We're dealing with idolatry versus worshiping God rightly. Okay, versus worshiping God rightly. And I have to actually demonstrate before my kids, and we all have to demonstrate before our kids what it means to worship God on a practical level. Not just going to church. Okay, not just going to church on Sunday and worshiping with the saints, but then to turn around and come home and actually worship the government and the world and yourself. That's one day. They live with you every day, <laughs> okay? So God is calling us to be um, uh, honorable to the Lord so that we can sow good seed to our children because God promises. He promises that they will be blessed, that he will show them mercy. He is abundant. He is full of mercy. And the subpoint that we're on is subpoint A is he his mercy is throughout the ages, all right, throughout the ages. Um, and lastly, I just want you to notice as we're moving up to sub point B, um, what God promises when he says showing mercy to thousands, thousands of generations, not thousands of people, but thousands upon thousands of generations of people, okay? So he, he's, he is a merciful God. Um, he, this here has to do not just with the, with, with the Emmanuel principle of God being with his people and never leaving him or forsaking him, but it's the preservation of the gospel of the glory of God. Um, he promises to, he promises this, that there's going to be a people 
that worship me in every generation. He's going to preserve a people. It might be a remnant. He's going to preserve a people. They're going to worship him. They're going to witness for him. They're going to do warfare for him, right? They're, they're, they're going to share the gospel. They're going to preach the gospel. The gospel is going to be preserved. People are going to be saved from generation to generation to generation to generation. You see, by way of implication, he is preserving his gospel by, by this promise that he makes, showing mercy to thousands. And sub so point B, his mercy is abundant. His mercy is abundant. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 14. I want you to see Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Verses 18 through 19. Um, in verse 18, it says, The Lord is long suffering. And of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation. Verse 19, pardon, I beseech you, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of your what? Of your mercy. And as you have forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now, even until now. Um, also, turn with me to Psalm 57, Psalm 57. Let's look at it here, Psalm 57. In Psalm 57, we're looking at Verse 10. I'll start at verse 9. I will praise you, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto you among the nations. For your mercy is great unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. His mercy is talked about quite frequently. Turn to uh, Psalm 86. Look at Psalm 86. Let's keep on working this out. And in Psalm 86, look at verse 15. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. We can go on and on, but he is abundant. Now let's look at a New Testament passage. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I can quote it from the top of my head, but let's turn there and let's make sure that we are um, looking at it as we talk about it. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 4. But God, who is rich in what? He's rich in mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. Now, here's the, the plight. Here is the misery. Here is um, the point of destitution. We are destitute of life. Um, we are dead in trespasses and sins, separated from the life of God. Um, we um, are, are uh, children of wrath, even as others living in this world according to its course under the, the, the governance of the principality and powers of the air under spiritual wickedness. Um, while we're in this plight, in this place, in this place, while we were dead. So this is where mercy shines in its full glory. It's, in, it's when you're in a place where you are helpless. It's in a place where you, are, you can't move. You cannot do anything that would semblance life. You can't love God. You can't love God. You can't see God. You can't live for God. You can't believe the gospel. You can't do any of those things. You can't, you can't um, follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like when you're dead in trespasses and sins, you are totally enabled, you're, you're, you're unable to do one righteous thing. 
This is what the scriptures teach. Now, those who, those who are humanists, those who are humanists theologically don't like what I'm actually saying. Really, they don't like what the scriptures say because it puts you in such a bad place. And the reason why it does is not so God can look better than you, but it's because it's the truth. And it's designed for you to see the grandeur and greatness of God's glory in saving your soul. This is why God does not, he does not hesitate when it comes to his apostles in the spirit of God leading them to let us know where we were when he saved us. When he, when he, when he displayed his love upon us. It was while we were dead in trespasses and sins. And this is the greatness of his mercy. The greatness of his, the richness of his mercy, uh, of his mercy um, that's rooted in the greatness of his love. While we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. This is amazing. While you were dead, you were united to Christ. So that means that if you are united to the Lord Jesus Christ while you were dead in trespasses and sins, your decision did not unite you to Christ. Your choice of Jesus Christ did not unite you to Christ. It did not bring you into union with God. It was God's mercy that brought you into union with God by his divine power, by quickening you. He brought you into union with Christ while you were dead, while you were dead in trespasses and sins. Quicken you together with Christ, for by grace are you saved, and has risen us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he didn't just accomplish that. He didn't decree that. He didn't just decree that before the foundation of the world and then accomplish it, but he told us about it. And our eyes are open, and we were actually brought into an experience of that union. Here in verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness or his mercy towards us in Christ Jesus. So, you know, he is abundant in mercy, and this leads to adoration. This leads to adoration. Um, so this here is the high point. God shows mercy, and it results. It results in worshiping. It should, it should result. Now, what did Moses do after God revealed who he was? When he came down, and he says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, abundant in goodness and in truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity, transgression, and sin, and will by no means clear the guilty, but will visit the sins, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. What did Moses do? He bowed his face to the dust and he worshiped. He worshiped. Now, this is what this is about, really. Even in our context in Exodus chapter 20, it's in the context of not worshiping idols. And not serving them, but worshiping God out of love for him, worshiping him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and rejecting others that might try to take his place and try to rival him. All right, so we can continue, but but there's something here. I think it's Psalm yeah, 106. Let's go to Psalm 106. I'll, I'll read that one, and then we'll move to point number three. Point number three needs to be dealt with here. Uh, so it's a point that that uh, we need to uh, work through. In Psalm 106, look at Psalm 106. Is it, the psalmist gives an imperative. Praise ye the Lord. Children, listen to this. Praise ye the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good. Now, what's about to happen here is his goodness is about to be explained. For he is good. Why is he good? For his mercy 
in yours forever. This is amazing. Now, when he says shows mercy to thousands, when we're talking about thousands upon thousands of generations of people, we're not just talking about uh, his mm -hmm. uh, the abundance in the sense of size, but we're talking about the longevity of it. it is everlasting. He never, but when we think about the idea of abundance or plenty, you're not ever thinking about that, whatever that is you're thinking about, running out or stopping. You're never thinking about that. You have an abundance, right? God, when it says God is full of mercy, God has mercy for all of his people for all eternity. For all eternity, right? For all eternity. And I'm so grateful and thankful because I need his mercies. These, this mercy, I need. This redeeming mercy, this redeeming love, I need forever. I don't know about you, but I, I do. I do. There's so much more we can talk about, but let's go to point number three. Let's go back to Exodus chapter uh, 20, verse six. We talked about um, the fact that God loves to show mercy to those that are destitute. Um, it has to do with his goodness, the display of his goodness, and how God, la and how God lavishly pours out his mercy to thousands to demonstrate his greatness, all right? But now we're going to talk about God limiting. He limits his covenant mercies to the faithful, and this is for his glory. And in Exodus chapter 20, and I want to show you how I broke this up. I first just broke up the first three words in showing mercy. So God loves to show mercy. And then the second point, he lavishes, and lavishly pours out his mercy to thousands. So he not only shows mercy, but he shows mercy unto thousands. And not only that, but the final point, point number three, is how I broke up this one verse. Point number three, God limits his covenant mercies to the faithful. Here, you see him say, not only does he show mercy and that he shows mercy to thousands, but to thousands of them that what? Love him and keep his commandments. So we are dealing with God's conditional love. We're dealing with God's conditional love, this man, right here. It's conditional. Like, do you, do you really think, and, and this, is, this has to do with God's justice here, for, for example. Is God obligated to show a person who actually hates God mercy? Is he obligated? He is not obligated. In fact, what, what God is obligated to do is to, is to hate him back. <laughs> right. And, and to execute judgment upon him. I am so glad that he is long-suffering. I'm so glad that he is long-suffering. And I'm so glad that there's a mystery to the character and nature of God. Well, I don't understand. I mean, let's just be honest. I don't understand why God is so long suffering. Like, I'm thankful for it. I'm like, whoa, you people are running amok around here. There's times when I'm running amok. Let's tell the truth. We, 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 we act it up. Let's just tell the truth. Tell the truth. Um, and there's evils in the world that's affecting many people. Evils in the world. And sometimes I don't understand what God is doing. But what I do know is that he visits iniquity and he shows mercy. And they're qualified. They are qualified. To those who hate him, he visits their iniquity. To those who love him, he shows mercy. He shows mercy. I mean... You guys have heard the verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. That's precisely what he's saying here. Because it is God's expression of goodness when he shows mercy. I already We talked about this last week when we went to Exodus 33 and we read a couple other passages, right? But here, I want to I want to pinpoint the fact that he limits his covenant mercies to the faithful for his own glory. Now, so point A says this, discriminating mercy is his divine what? <clears throat> Y'all looking at your outline? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, she wasn't bringing it for you. 
She's being discriminated. <laughs> She's discriminating. She's like, no, 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 this is from my dad. Okay. All right. So, so, so here, discriminating mercy is his divine right. Does God have a right to show mercy to whoever he wants to? I mean, he's full of it. He's full of mercy. It's his mercy, right? Doesn't he have a right to show mercy to whoever he wants to? He has a right to show mercy to whoever he wants to. And this is the point. He doesn't show mercy to everyone. Whatever this kind of mercy is here in Exodus chapter 20, this is what I'm referring to contextually. Whatever this mercy is, he does not show it to everyone. This is, I mean... It's not hard to understand, right? It's not hard to understand. It's um, it's easy to understand. It's just a hard pill to swallow because what we're getting at here has to do with God's sovereignty in showing mercy. Okay, God is sovereign. That's the Lord that we worship, that we serve. Like we don't have we don't have the right to tell God who to show mercy to. Okay, we we don't even get because if we're mindful of the covenant, if we're mindful of being covenant people, we're not in the position to make any demands to God, nor are we in the position to set any terms or change conditions or make amendments to that covenant. We don't get to do that because it is a covenant as um, well, Palmer Robertson would say it is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. So we, we, those who, are, who believe on Christ, who say that they're Christians and are mindful of this covenant of grace that we find ourselves in, we find ourselves in it, again, by grace, according to his rich mercies. That's why we have a relationship with God. That's why we have a hope for glory. And we recognize something about God of what he did not have to do for us. He did not have to show us mercy. He did not have to show us mercy. Um, look at Exodus chapter uh, 33. Actually, turn to, um, no, no, no. Turn to Proverbs chapter 19. Let's go to Proverbs 19. I went to Exodus 33, verse 18 and 19 last week. And I want to uh, <clears throat> deal with other passages. <clears throat> verse 19. Now, verse 11. The discretion of a man defers his anger. The discretion of a man defers his anger. And it is his glory to pass over a what? A transgression. Now, what point am I making here? It is God's glory to pass over our transgressions. Isn't that right? It is his glory. He defers his anger. So mercy is God deferring his anger and passing over a transgression, but he still is executing judgment on that transgression. He's just deferring his anger towards us and passing over us, his wrath. Oh, he's passing us and his wrath is going to another location. Justice is still being executed and, and, and wrath is still being poured out. Wrath is being deferred towards us. And we are being passed over. So let's, let, let, let's talk about it like this. There's a reason why God would defer his anger towards us and pass over us. Just like there was a reason why God deferred his anger towards Israel and on the day of the Passover, passed over Israel. And it was something that he saw that was on the doorpost of their house. And it was the blood of an innocent lamb. That's why he passed over those people and he deferred his anger towards them. And he executed his anger and his wrath upon the Egyptians who did not have a substitute and they did not have a sacrifice. Why would God defer his anger and pass over? Well, because he already executed his anger in punishing Jesus Christ on our behalf. He is the lamb slain from before the foundation 
of the mm -hmm. world. That lamb, mm -hmm. that lamb represented, the blood of the lamb represented justice being satisfied and met on behalf of those in that house. Okay? And, 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 and God cannot demand twice he cannot demand twice what he has already judged and executed. That will be double jeopardy, right? So God is demonstrating, even in this text, he, he says the, the, the wrath of, let's, let's see here, verse um, 11. Yeah, the discretion of a man defers his anger, and it is the glory, it is his glory to pass over a transgression. And we see that historically, we see it in principle. Let's turn to Romans chapter 9 real quick, Romans chapter 9. And, 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 and to God be the glory, because look, he ain't passing us over because of us. Right. <laughs> He's like, it's not because of us. Trust me, you know. I, woo, man, I must have did something. I didn't even remember what I did. So, so I can make sure that when God is coming again, that he passes over me again. Well, God will set that straight. Won't he? Yes, He'll he set will. that straight. He will set that self-righteousness straight. He will root it out, right, to let you know that it's not even anything in you that 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 god is attracted to naturally that will cause him to love you and to and to show mercy to you and to pass over you but it's the blood the precious and priceless and spotless blood of jesus christ the god man that is why he passes over us guilty and wretched sinners now in romans chapter 9 this is one of the um uh, passages of scripture that um, there, there's much debate over and, and people really don't like visiting because it's very clear about the sovereignty of God and showing mercy, okay? Very clear about God being discriminant on who he loves and who he hates. So when so, so when, when, when we develop the idea of discrimination and then you see passages like this, you realize God does this all the time. He does this all the time. All the time. He does it all the time. This is who God is. But look at verse 12. Let's start at verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calls. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I what? Love. Have I loved? But Esau have I what? Hated. Now here we see discrimination taking place. And I want you to understand it's not based upon what they did in their life. So so this is one of my um my one of my greatest uh one of my uh, in my opinion one of one of the arguments against you know abortion um, because before they ever had a, before they were ever born, God loved them. God, God loved Jacob before he was born. Before he was born. Before they had done any good or evil, God had a purpose according to election that was going to stand. Before they were born, someone was loved and someone was hated, and it was not based upon anything they did. You see what I'm saying? And 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 when people in, in the government and they 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 you know they they, they want to you know and people around the world that worship the government that's pro-life or I'm sorry that's that's pro-choice um, or, or pro-abortion. Um, those that, that are pro-choice and, and pro-abortion are are anti-God and anti and, and, and unbiblical. I just want to say that for everybody. Mm -hmm. Unbiblical. Unbiblical, unchristian. I, no one gets to tell me what I do with my body. You don't even get to, get to tell yourself what you do with your body. You have been bought with the price. But the point, I don't want to go on a, 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 a train. The, the point here is that if God loves someone before they were born, that means that before you were born, you were a person. Right. You are a person. How is God going to love something that's not a person? Right. All right, how's he gonna hate something about how? That, so again, that just wanted to lay it out there. I don't know if you heard that, but that's that's something I want to lay out there. But here, the point that we want to make is that um, God is being discriminant. He's being discriminant. Look at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Now here's the point. 
that Paul anticipates. Because a lot of people will say, and they say this today, especially the LGBTQ community, they, they, they want to make sure that nobody discriminates against them choosing to be what they're not and to live a life that they're not supposed to live. And those that do must be punished. Aren't they discriminating? <laughs> no discrimination, but I get to discriminate against those discriminated against me. What? A bunch of hypocrisy, right? A bunch of hypocrisy. But here's the point that I'm making here. A lot of people will say that God being discriminant and Christians being discriminant in a good way is wrong. It's wrong. That, that everybody should be given a chance for God's mercy. Now, I'll say this real quick and move on. If this is about fairness, you're missing the point altogether because mercy is not justice. Mercy is not fairness. So <laughs> we're conflating categories. If so, that's not fair. Say, we're not talking about fairness. We're talking about mercy. We're not talking about justice. We're talking about mercy. So that category goes over here, first of all. See, people don't think well. As our pastor was telling us, people don't think. That's not fair. That, I don't, I, I, that's not right. What do you mean? That's not right. That's not fair. We're talking about mercy here. Number one. But that's the people's go-to. Their God, the, the God that, most, that a lot of people worship is a um, God that is really a servant to them in their theology. It's a crafted idol where God actually is obligated to show everyone mercy and to give everyone an opportunity to be saved. Otherwise, they're judged. God, that God is judged by the people. Now here, is there any unrighteousness with God in loving one and hating another simply because he chose to? It says, God forbid. Now, you would say, yes, it is unrighteous. But the answer is, God forbid. No, but it's, it's, not, it's not unrighteousness with God. God, have, God is right. So verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. This is amazing. <coughs> I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 16, so then it is not of him that wills. It's not of the will. It is not of him that runs. It's not of works, but it's of God that shows mercy but it has to do with God's sovereign prerogative. It's his right. It's his, it's his sovereign right and prerogative. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, he hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he pardon. So now we see discrimination taking place. He has mercy on some and he hardens others, meaning he removes restraints. He removes restraints from the heart and gives a person over to what they desire and want to do. It's not that God actually keeps people from doing what they ultimately want to do when it comes to hardening the heart and God making them do it. No, God releases them to do it. Does that make sense? Like we have to get that, we have to get that straight. Like this is how, and then on top of that, we even get to see God's sovereignty in that. I said it last week. You know, you can't even see him without God removing the restraint. Lord, don't remove the restraint. Amen. Don't remove Amen. the restraint, Lord. Don't move the restraint, Lord. Don't move the restraint. Keep me, preserve me, have mercy upon me, right? Yeah. This is what we need. Yeah. We need God's mercy. All right. Now look at look at look at verse uh, eighteen. Yeah, so verse eighteen. Therefore, he'll show mercy on whom he will, and, and, and whom he will as he hardens. And this is talking historically about Pharaoh, um, but but really, what what he did here is he went to Pharaoh. He went to redemptive history, and in, in verse seventeen, and then in verse eighteen, he drew a universal and absolute principle of something about the sovereignty of God. This is what God does 
God shows mercy to whoever he wants, and he hardens others. He hardens others. He hardens others. Now, I have so much more to say, but look at subpoint B, and I think two, two minutes? Yeah, two minutes. Um, subpoint B. Subpoint B. Uh, it is only the righteous. It is only to the righteous. Now, this is a critical, critical, critical uh, statement. It is only to the righteous that he shows mercy. Only to the righteous. Which means that the, the righteous that I'm referring to are not those who are intrinsically righteous because they're being shown mercy, right? They're being shown mercy, right? So like, though even like we don't naturally deserve the mercy of God, but we are declared to be righteous by God, by what? By faith in Christ. By faith in Christ. The just live by what? Faith. Faith. Those who are just are those who are righteous and we're righteous, not in ourselves, but in who? Christ. Right. So this is, this is we, we want to keep it very simple, but he shows mercy to those who are in Christ. Did you get in Christ when you believe? No. 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 <laughs> this is amazing. This is what I'm saying. Like those who experience mercy in time, it's like the, the, the redeeming mercy of God, they experience it because they are in someone from before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1, verse, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, even as he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children. This is amazing. Like we were in him before the foundation of the world. And Jesus was righteous before the foundation of the world. He was our righteousness before the found, before anything was laid, anything was created. This is how this, this can make sense when you look, read it in Exodus, <laughs> okay? When you read it and God says, I only show mercy to thousands of them that love me and that keep my commandments. Wow. How do you make sense of that before, before Moses or before Exodus in Genesis where God showed mercy to Adam and Eve? Who were they in before the foundation of the world? Christ. Who was Abel in? Christ, who was a, uh, let's say Abel, Abraham, Christ, all of the Old Testament saints, they already were in him, just like we were as well. But in Psalm 103, look at Psalm 103. Let's listen to Psalm 103. I think we're going to end right here. I have to. And then we'll pick up next week. By the way, next week is going to be our last Thursday night Bible study um, and for the year. Um, you know, pray for me with, with regards to school, seminary, because you know, it's very, very uh, tough, um, especially the schedule I have right now. And, uh, you know, my class is in December 22nd. So right before my anniversary and right before Christmas. So pray, because I can, I, I, I really can't do both right now. To, you know, God, God, God is giving me grace to, to, to take a break and to, to press in on that. So I want to want to get that done. But, uh, Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Let's look at verse 11. Uh, actually, yeah, verse 11. Okay, verse 11. It says this. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his what? Mercy. Y'all still with me? So great is his mercy towards them that what? that fear him see see that qualifier there to them that fear him so his mercy is high above it's like how high the heavens is 
it displays like when you look up into the stars and you look up into the sky and you here in the airplane you look down and you see everything from top down in the vastness of this world you're to think about the greatness of his mercy okay you're to think about the greatness of his mercy but it's only towards those that fear him to those that fear him. Look at verse 17. Verse, uh, let's look at uh, 16. For the wind pass over it, and it is gone, and the place there shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto the children's children. So we see that his mercy is from everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto the children's children. Verse 18, to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. So his mercy is forever, it's eternal, only for those who fear him, to such as keep his commandments and to those that remember his covenant to do them. All right, I have more to say, but let's end it right here. Uh, um, his mercy is only to the righteous. And God has a right to show mercy to whoever he does. And those who are righteous are those who are chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. And those who are chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world are manifested by simply putting their trust in Jesus Christ. Next week, we're going to talk about the discriminating mercies of a jealous God, part three. And we're going to in these uh, points, and then I'm going to have questions and, and answers and, and details about how we're going to move forward in this year um, in terms of hanging out and getting to know each other um, and when we're going to start back again in the new year, which is January the 6th. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this study. We thank you so much for your presence and for your power, the power of your word, the clarity of your word. We ask that you would continue to be yourself, um, for we're thankful for who you are and how you have revealed yourself to us through your word and in your son and have shown us this mercy that we don't deserve. You have shown your people favor and you get all the glory for it. It's because of you that we're in Christ who has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We thank you so much for placing us in Christ, and we pray for our loved ones who may who do not know you right now. We pray for their salvation. Uh, we pray, oh God, that you would help some of us that are struggling um, with any and everything um, in heart and in mind, in public and in private. Um, the those of us that are uh, that are not able to honor you in certain areas of our life that are stuck and that may be enslaved to certain things, we pray that you would you would help us, you would you would deliver us, and you would show us mercy, oh God, that we might worship you even in those areas, Lord. That the the goal for us is to worship you perfectly, and and we know that we won't we won't uh, get that until we get home, until Christ returns, until we stand in your presence. And so we, we ask that you would keep us, that you would sanctify us by your truth, for your word is true. Forgive us of our sins and all of our transgressions. Bless those that have come out, that you would give them safe traveling mercies home. And bless everyone that have attended to this study, that you would deepen their understanding and, and commune with them in the privacy of their own hearts as they commune with you so that they may, uh, they may have intimate fellowship with you. Um, and that they may go deeper, take, they, they, they may go deeper with you that, you know, your truth may take root downward and bear fruit upward for your glory. Lord, thank you so much for being with us and for blessing us this, this year of uh, Bible study out here in the mountain house. We pray that you would um, keep us and sustain us um, and that you preserve us and help us to meet next week. And if you, if, if you tear this in your son and and for us to have a good time of fellowship, and then for us to spend the rest of the year getting to know each other for your glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Amen.